Uh, let's take our Bibles and turn to um, 1 Timothy chapter 5. <clears throat> For those who are visiting, we are working our way verse by verse through 1 and 2 Timothy. Um, you may remember the um, week before last, I taught on um, the last, actually verses 12 through 16 of chapter 4, which dealt with... Um, Paul's instructions to Timothy. You remember, Timothy was a, a very young man, and he was given a very large responsibility by the Apostle Paul to act on his behalf and to train elders in the church in Ephesus and to ordain them, and that really was a responsibility that normally would be given to a much more mature man who had a lot more life experience. But Timothy was an exceptional young man. In what way was Timothy exceptional? Well, besides being young. He was trained from, from early on by his mother All right. in the word of the Lord. Paul says that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, right? He talks about how his mother and his grandmother had great faith and that they had trained him um, in the things of God from really almost infancy and taught him the Holy Scriptures from the time he was a little child. And as a young man now, probably in his 20s, he had far more knowledge and wisdom in the things of God than men that were decades older than he was. And so the Apostle Paul, rather than putting an older man in this role and responsible, uh, responsibility, he gave it to Timothy. But in chapter 4, the last part of chapter 4 deals with the problem that can arise when we have such a young person being given such great responsibilities. And the problem that we, that we talked about, that he deals with here, had to do with um, him being intimidated by the older people, and for him not to be timid in the way that he led, but to be bold, right? But at the same time, he was to um, set an example. The Apostle Paul says to be a template or an example for the believers, as opposed to lording it over them and and, you know, telling them you must do this because I say so. Model good Christian behavior before them so that they can see it in action. And don't be timid. That's essentially what we get out of verses 12 through 16 of the previous chapter. But now, in chapter 5, the Apostle Paul deals with another issue that can arise when you have a very young man being given a, 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 such a great position of authority. And what, what's, the other, what's the other possibility? Let me, let me just, let's just talk about that for a minute. What do you think, if you put a young man in a position of great authority over other people who are much older than him, aside from being you know, timid and being intimidated by the people, what's the other thing that can happen in that situation? Okay, he becomes arrogant and proud. Isn't that right? Arrogance, proud, he thinks he is somebody. You know, have you ever seen young people that you give them a little bit of authority and then all of a sudden they think they're, you know, they think they're all that? You know what I'm talking about, right? What's that, Walter? Yeah. Well, that's, what, that's the, other, the other potential problem that arises. So let's look at what Paul says in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5. He says, You should not rebuke an older man, but instead plead with him as a father. Treat the younger men as brothers, treat the older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters in all purity. So what he's doing is he's, he's comparing this, Timothy and his situation of authority, to a young man in a family. You have a father, you have a mother, and you have brothers and sisters. Now, how do you speak to your father? Yeah, do you talk down to your father? Well, some people do, but they deserve a good, you know, punch in the nose when they do that. Isn't that right? <laughs> do you talk down to your mother? Do you talk to your brother or sister as though you have authority over them? Or do you talk to them as being your equals? Being That's your equals. Hard. What's that? That's hard. It is hard. I'm an only child, but I know that <laughs> So you can't relate. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I can't. Watch David's three daughters, 
Mm -hmm. And I see these. The dynamics there? Yeah. Yeah. The the Apostle Paul is trying to give Timothy the sense of, yes, you are in a position of authority. Yes, you have great power as my representative in, in this situation. But at the same time, don't let it go to your head. All right? Don't let it go to your head. How you treat other people is critical. Now, if we're going to apply this to what we're talking about throughout these books, which is training up young men to fill leadership roles, then these, these things are, are for you if you're one of those young men, okay? All right, don't, if, if you're given a responsibility, don't let it go to your head. Now, if you remember back in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, when the Apostle Paul was giving instructions to Timothy about who to ordain as elders, he said, not a novice. What's a novice? Right. Somebody who is inexperienced. And, and then he gives a reason. Why not a novice? Why shouldn't a novice be an elder? Lest being puffed up with pride, he falls into the same condemnation as the devil. Now, why should a novice have pride? Do those two things go together? No. Does a novice, somebody who is, you know, just, you know, just learning the Christian faith or is, you know, doesn't have a lot of life experience... Should he be puffed up with pride? No, because no, he's stupid, right? He doesn't know a whole lot. I mean, let's face it. You know, knowledge comes from experience, not just, you know, reading a book. Should he, be, should he be puffed up with pride? No. So why is it then that he's puffed up with pride? Why could he get puffed up with pride? Because he's been given an area of great responsibility. That's, why, that's what an, el- an elder is. He's a leader in the church, right? And he is, a, he is a person with great responsibility. So if you appoint somebody to be an elder who is, doesn't have that experience, who doesn't have the wisdom and the knowledge of years and study of the scriptures and living out the Christian life, and you appoint him in that role, there's a possibility that it's going to go to his head and he's going to think that he is greater than he really is. Isn't that right? Now, what's the difference between the Apostle Paul telling Timothy not to ordain a novice as an elder, and Timothy being given, as a young man, being given this great responsibility even to train and ordain elders. A novice doesn't have anything to do with chronological age. Okay, that's right. He wasn't a novice. That's right. Was Timothy a novice? No. No, he had known the scriptures from childhood. He had been trained and he had been uh, following the word of God and he had been living out a life, and he, his actions had demonstrated his character as a true young man of God. Even though he was young, he was not a novice. All right, so what that means essentially is novice doesn't necessarily equate to the number of years lived. It equates to the maturity and the character of the person, all right, as well as the knowledge that they have. Now, what happens when, I mean, m- many of you have known of young preachers. There's nothing wrong with a young preacher if he is an exceptional young man like Timothy was. But how many of you have known of preachers who become proud and arrogant? What are some of the signs? Let's, let's think about that. What are some of the symptoms of a, somebody in that role? Becoming proud and arrogant. Is pride a sin? The pride that the Bible talks about is a sin. Pride is thinking more of yourself than you ought to. Okay? It's not measuring yourself by God's standard and comparing yourself to God and his standard. It's comparing yourself to other people and having an inflated ego. Right? So what are some of the symptoms of pastors? Preachers who have an inflated ego. You all have known some. Don't mention their names, please. But give me some characteristics of pastors or preachers that have an inflated ego. Walter, go ahead. Um, One, they're usually unapproachable. They think they're above you. And they're hard to approach, and they're always right. Don't question me. 
question. Right? Don't question me. Don't challenge me. Okay, that's one. What else? They Good. They will not be corrected. They'd rather buy a Rolex and a jet plane. Good. It starts transferring over into money. I should live more large than you do. Right? Why? Because I'm somebody and you're a nobody. What else? They step into the role of God, condemning people. Okay. They become judgmental. What else? Yes, Amy. Oh, yeah, they become the center of attention, right? And another thing you'll notice is their illustrations that they might give in their sermons are all about themselves. You notice those too, right? What else? I was uh, watching a woman on television, mm -hmm. and she said, um, I will crawl across the stage, and if I break a fingernail, I can always have another one put back on. <laughs> and I was thinking... <laughs> I, spend that money, put I, that back on that people, you know, send to you for other things. You, you know, you know what I'm trying to say. I, I have no context for that kind of a comment. Yeah. Put it into the, the congregation. Okay. And that, that yeah. It's kind. Of, there's a sense of arrogance in that, right? Yeah. In your mind? All right, Stephen, what else? Uh, some of them will claim special knowledge and revelation of God. Okay. Claims that God speaks to me in ways he doesn't speak to you. Yeah. Right? God is leading me to sell our church and buy a bigger one. Or a plane. Or buy a plane. I need a plane, right? God is leading me to do this. God appeared to me and said... Pastor so-and-so, this is what I want you to do. But you're like, okay, well, God doesn't talk to me like that, and I haven't gotten an email from God. How come he gets all that and I don't? <laughs> the mail must be slow. The mail's slow, yeah. What else? Go ahead, Jennifer. If, if, if they're driving an agenda, yeah. Yeah. What else? There's another one that's important. Go ahead, uh, Diane. Okay, they hobnob with the snobs. What else? Or the wealthy people. They take them out of context. Yeah, but there's there's people who aren't arrogant that are that do that. Even they're just dumb or, or ignorant. Okay, yeah, they might, but they, there's something else that is common among preachers who become lifted up with pride and arrogance, particularly young men. You know what that is? Thinking that the rules don't apply to them. You know what I'm talking about? Thinking that they can have a little affair on the side and still preach God's word. You know what I mean? You've been to churches who've... Yeah. Yeah. And it's a cover-up. There's a cover-up. There's a... Yeah. Yeah. And then he's still going to lead. He's still equipped to lead, even though he's, you know, having a little fling with the secretary. You guys, you guys have heard those kinds of stories all the time, right? You know where that comes from? Pride. Arrogance. Thinking you are above the standard that God has set in his word for the rest of the people. Walter. Yeah, but he, why, well, let me ask you, Walter, why... Do people not fear God? I see a hand. Amy? You, you're too slow, Walter. Sorry. <laughs> Amy? Because they get overly confident in their own ability. Okay. And what does that mean? Pride. They, they have an estimation of themselves that is far too high. Right? Again, we are always, as Christians, to compare ourselves to God and to his son, Jesus Christ, that's the standard. How far short do we fall of that standard? I'm like, you know, an inch off the floor if that's the standard. Right? But what we do is we start to compare ourselves to somebody else or to other people. And what happens when we do that? 
Well, I'm smarter than he is. How do I know I'm smarter than he is? Because look at my position. Right? We've elevated ourselves. This is where danger, 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 danger. When you start seeing those signs, there's a big problem. You know what Paul said? Look what Paul said again in 1 Timothy 3.6. He said, not a novice left being lifted or puffed up with pride. He falls into the same condemnation as the devil. And what was the devil's problem? I, I, I. I shall be like the Most High. Right? Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. I shall be like the Most High. I want to have the praise. I want to have the worship. Pride. Hmm. Is it, are there preachers standing in pulpits that are sinning in exactly the same way that the devil sinned and fell from God's grace? Yes. They are, yes. The other thing is, is they try to, they're focused on building their own kingdom as opposed to Christ's kingdom. Well, that's right. That's, that's a sign. Um, but but that kind of sums up some of these other things that we have talked about. You know, look at how, look what Paul says here in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 again. When, he tell, when he's telling Timothy how he's to interact with the various groups of people in the congregation, he talks about the older men, the older women, the younger men, and the younger brothers. As a leader, as a young man, how is he to interact with all these different people groups? Look, look at it. Number one, don't rebuke an older man. Don't talk down to him. Even if you're right and he's wrong. Even if you are correcting him. How do you, you know, have, have you seen preachers who talk down to people, who correct people, who kind of deride people? Either publicly or even privately. You know, you don't talk to me like that, or they, you know, they're getting their face, or something like that. I'm sure some of you have known preachers where you went with a, a legitimate concern to talk to them privately, and then they were all up in your face yeah. about it. Anybody ever had that happen to them? I have. You went in a meek and humble attitude, and they get all up to, uptight about it. All right? You have a concern. It happens all the time. How, how is the young man in leadership to treat the older men? You plead with him like you would do your own father. Treat him like your father. You don't go get up in your father's face. Isn't that right? Why not? Because you have respect for him and you consider him to be greater than you are. That is, he has age, he has, he has given birth. You know, he has fathered you. <laughs> Doesn't that make him superior to you? Yes, of course it does. It makes him your superior. So you're going to treat an older man, as a young man, you're going to talk to an older man in the congregation. Even though you have authority in your office, you're going to talk to him as though he's your dad. Dad, look, I love you, but I wish you wouldn't do such and such. That's different than pointing your finger in his face, right? There's a difference. Number two. Treat the older ladies like they're your own mother. It's the same idea, exact same concept. Number three, younger men as brothers. What that means is equal. Timothy was a young man. If, if I have a position of authority as your pastor, if I talk to someone my own age, or someone who doesn't hold the same office that I hold in the church, I'm not to talk down to them. I am to consider them to be my equal and talk to them as though they're my equal. All right? And then finally, the younger women as sisters in all purity. This is a problem. You notice, you notice the issue of purity only came up when he talked about younger women and Timothy's relationship with younger women. Isn't that right? He didn't say with the older women because that's not normally an issue, right? A young guy, he's not normally attracted to somebody that's, you know, two or three decades older than he is. <laughs> you know nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's just the way things are. But with the younger women, the issue of purity comes up. He mentions it specifically. Is there a problem in churches with younger preachers, and sometimes older preachers, but let's say particularly with younger preachers, 
who start getting a little too cozy with some of the young ladies in the church. Is that a problem? Hey, it's wrecked churches all over the country. Isn't that right? You guys are nodding your heads because you know specific examples of that. What's that? Even the president. Yeah. I mean, Bill Clinton had an issue, you know, if we're going to talk about that. I want you to look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Speaking also to Timothy in his second epistle, uh, he says something very interesting here. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. All right, I have to put my glasses on. I'm sorry, it's just one of those things. But in every, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, that is the dishonorable things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work, flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Those two things go together. Flee youthful lusts and instead call on God out of a pure heart. And the, he's contrasting the two. See, a pure heart is not a heart that lusts. Youthful lusts. If he says youthful lusts, he's, he's not talking about wanting a jaguar. He's talking about, you know, having a wandering eye for other women. That's what he's talking about. Did you notice he used the word flee? Flee? Run. 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 Get out of there like your pants are on fire. Because they are. Isn't that what he said? Flee. Get out of there. Don't, you know, tell me something. Is there an example in the Bible, a good example of this exact thing in the Bible? Joseph. Yeah, let's look at Joseph. I like Joseph. Genesis. Genesis chapter 39. Verse 1, came to pass at that time, okay, that's 38, Verse 30, uh, chapter 39. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Now, was Joseph a young man or an older man? Yeah. Young man. Probably in his 20s, all right? Maybe even in his teens, but probably in his 20s. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in, in his sight and served him. Then he, that is Potiphar, made him overseer of his house. Wow, a young guy put in a position of great authority. That is, he was the... the man who was in charge of all the other servants, and no doubt many of those other servants were, young, were older men. But Joseph, a young guy, is put in charge of them all. He has, he has control over Potiphar's finances and all that kind of stuff. It's a great area of responsibility. And all that he had, he put under his authority. So it was that from the time that he had made him an overseer of his house, and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. <laughs> he didn't even worry about checking his bank balance online. He knew Joseph had it under control. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And it came to pass after these things. Now, we don't have anybody like that here, so we don't have to worry about that, do we? Okay, never mind. That was a joke. You guys didn't get it. <laughs> and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife 
cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in the house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were inside, that she caught him by his garment and said, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled. And now I want you to notice the word fled. Isn't that what Paul said to Timothy? Flee that youthful lust. Right? Get out of there. I think he had Joseph in mind. I really do. He used the same terminology. And the situation was exactly the same with Joseph. Flee out of there. So he fled and he ran outside. And it was so when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside that she called the men of her house and spoke to them saying, see, he has brought it on us. You know, you know the rest of the story. She accused him of trying to rape her because he couldn't get away from her unless he let go of his coat. And he did, and she had his coat, and now she's got evidence, supposedly, right? I mean, it didn't turn out so well with him, but he did the right thing, right? He did the right thing, and in the end, God ended up blessing him and putting him as a ruler over all of Egypt because he was faithful in that situation, right? Flee those things. Flee those things. I think it's interesting yes. that he said, how can I do this and sin against God? He didn't say, how can I do this to Potiphar? Yeah, that's right. He had, he had the right understanding of who, who his accountability was to. Isn't that right? All right, I want you to look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 because, you know, if you're a young man and you're thinking about maybe someday being in ministry, um, being holding an office like Timothy held, you might be thinking to yourself, man, it's hard. It's hard for me to look out at the opposite sex and see all these great looking chicks here. Right? <laughs> I mean, listen, what is more of a chick magnet than a good looking young man in a place of power. Am I right? What are women like? Strong men. Good looking men. Hey, let's face it, it's true. Okay? That's what they like. They're attracted to that. So what are you going to get if you're strong, good looking, and you're in a place of power? The girls are going to throw themselves at you. Hey, you know, I'm just saying, not all of them. But some will. Guaranteed. What are you going to do? Hey, that, it'll happen in the church, too. I'm not talking about just, you know, somewhere else. I'm talking about in the church, it will happen. And what are you going to do? You can be like Joseph, or you can be like so many of these other preachers that think they can have a little on the side and not get caught because the rules don't apply to them. Hmm? Okay. So what do you do? You know, you're, you're a young guy, you're listening to my sermon. Some of the guys online are listening to my sermon. And they're saying, man, it's really hard for me to keep my thoughts where they ought to be. To keep from even entertaining the thoughts that come with that. What do I do? Well, that's a good question. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Hmm. Why should this young man in a position of power in the church be married? Why? What does he say? 
Why? He gives you the reason in verse right here. Because of sexual immorality. Because the temptation is so great. Every man should have a wife. And every woman should have a husband. Okay? That's why. And, but it's not just that. Look what it says next. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her. And likewise, also the wife to her husband. Now, look. <laughs> I see people laughing right there. You know what that means, don't you? He's using affection sort of as a uh, euphemism. <laughs> Take care of his needs is what he's saying to the ladies, to the wives. And to the husband, take care of your wife's needs. Right? You understand what I'm talking about. People are looking at me with blank stares on their face. I don't know if I'm coming through. <laughs> I see some, some nodding their heads. All right? Ladies, if you are married to a man who's in a position of authority in the church, take care of his needs. Okay? Go above and beyond to take care of his needs. <laughs> All right, and, and, and the man to do that for his wife. Because when, they're, when, they're, when that's a mutual thing, you know, it kind of builds on itself. But when you, when you ladies, look, I'm going to be frank, okay? When, you know, you didn't get what you wanted or something like that, and so you say, I'm not tonight, dear, I have a headache. And you use that as a way to punish him for something else. You're setting him up. I'm telling you, you're setting him up. Okay? You're making it more difficult for him in an area that he already struggles in. Don't do that. Okay? Just a little word of advice. Okay. I don't have that problem. <laughs> okay. What's that? <laughs> Diane's going like, okay, come on, move along, move along, move along. <laughs> Proverbs. The name Tim can be rearranged TMI. TMI, what's that? Mean? <laughs> TMI. Okay. I'm helping out the guys here, okay? So, ladies, you know, just bear with me. Proverbs chapter 5. Let's go there. I'm, I'm almost done here. We're just going to be done in just a couple of minutes. Proverbs chapter 5. My son, pay attention to my wisdom, lend your ear to my understanding that you may preserve, preserve discretion, and your lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. He's talking about temptation. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, and her steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path of life, her ways are unstable, you do not know them. In other words, what you see on the outside, the pretty package on the outside, that ain't what's on the inside, brother. That's what he's saying. Therefore, hear me now, my children, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Remove your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the cruel one lest aliens be filled with your wealth, and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And you mourn at last when your flesh and your body are consumed, and you say, how have I hated instruction, and my heart despised correction. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to those who instructed me. I was on the verge of total ruin in the midst of the assembly of the congregation. So what do you do? Look what he says. Drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. Isn't that a great metaphor? Don't be going to the neighbor's house to drink water from his well. Okay? Get it from your own well. <laughs> Should your fountains be dispersed abroad? Should you be drinking from the same well that some other guy's drinking from? Hey, you know, you get the metaphor, right? Streams of water in the streets. Do you want to go out and drink out of the mud puddles in the road? 
<laughs> We're getting a lot of humor out of this. But you guys get the point, right? That's what you're doing, guys. If you go and to somebody else's wife or to somebody else that's not your wife, you're drinking the puddles out of the street. Let them be your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed. He's talking about your wife, okay? And rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. I mean, hey, he's getting pretty graphic here, but we'll move right along. And always be enraptured with her love. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths, his own iniquities, and trap the wicked man, and he is caught in the cords of his sin. He shall die for lack of instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. Wow, this is powerful stuff, isn't it? Okay, so how... Guys, do you, do you rein that thing in? You know that sex drive. It's strong when you're young. How do you rein it in? Okay, one last scripture and we'll be done. Job chapter 31. Job was considered to be one of the most righteous men who had ever lived. And he had some advice from his own experience in this area. Verse 1, I have made a, by the way, in this passage, he's talking about his righteousness and why he has remained pure. He says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. You know, that's a contract. A covenant is a contract. I made a contract with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? Where does it start? Where does adultery and fornication start? Looking. Right? So he says, I made a covenant with my eyes. I'm not even going to look. If he saw a young lady that was attractive or dressed immodestly, he didn't Google her. And you know, I'm not talking about the search engine. He looked away. Isn't that what he did? Why then should I look upon a young woman? For what is the allotment of God from above and the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is it not the destruction of the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? What, you know what he's doing? He's saying that to start looking and lusting leads ultimately to an end conclusion. And what is that? God is going to destroy the wicked, including you. If you keep down that road, that's where it ends up. That's what he's saying. That's where it ends up. Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? If I have walked with falsehood or if my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed on the honest scales that God may know my integrity. You know what Job did? He said, I'm going to cut it off with looking. That's where I'm going to stop. See, a lot of guys think, you know what, I'll just look. And then I'll just get kind of friendly with so-and-so. And then maybe I'll just, you know, take her to dinner when, you know, I'm out of town or something. See, there's a progression until you end up defiling yourself. And what does Job do? He cuts it off at the very first sign. I make a covenant with my eyes. I'm not going to look and lust after her what he said. Stop it at the beginning. Stop it before it gets to a place where you can't stop. Because that's what happens with guys. I wonder how old right? he was when he wrote that. He was an older man. He was actually a, he was a ruler, but this is something he had practiced his whole life. In fact, if you read it in the context, he's talking about his whole character of his whole life. And this is something that he had done. And young men are, are you know, more susceptible to this. I mean, as you get older, it's not as big of a problem, but it's still, it's still a problem. All right? What's that? When, it's not a problem at all. <laughs> okay. Anyway, look, this is good advice. I know we've been a little graphic today, but this is good practical advice 
we have young men here, and we have some young men here that someday might be leaders in the church. All right? I'm putting you on the right track, if that's the case. And I'm talking not only to those here, but I'm talking to guys online in our satellite churches. A lot of good young men who want to serve God, who are learning and becoming mature. But this is an area that a lot of guys who start out thinking, you know, they're on the right path, they end up in the, you know, the train wreck thing in their ministry. All right? So, any questions, comments? No, I don't want to hear any life experience stories. Yes? Um, I was just thinking about earlier when you mentioned uh, young men having pride and the reason that they, one of the reasons why they might get that is when they start comparing themselves to other people. Yep. Like, well, at least, you know, I'm this and this and that person doesn't. And over my lifetime, I've learned that it's good to, to, if you're going to compare, to compare with where you came from, you yourself, where you come from, versus yeah. comparing with other people. Yeah, that's good. That's good advice. But ultimately, the standard is Christ. Right. Jesus is the standard of what a godly young man should be. And all of us fall short of that. But we all should judge ourselves based on him and his character, and his sinless nature, all right? Not on what somebody else is doing, because that's, you're going to get an inflated ego if you do that. All right, and then you're going to fall into a lot of these traps of greed and, and whatnot, and lust and things like that. All right, anybody else? We're done. Okay.